got this thing. Um, yeah, this is a multitasking nightmare because I have to turn this over. I've, I've got 15 slides, so I'm taking 15 as a theme a bit too literally. I might um, throw in a couple of mildly offensive swear words, so it's 15 certificate as well. So it can be 5 by 15 by 15 to the power of 15. Right, um, OK, um, this is my first slide. It's a word. It's glossophobia. Um, glossophobia isn't a very common word, but it's a very common thing. Glossophobia is the fear of this. It's the fear of public speaking. And people, and it's something I, I've suffered with before, and it's, it's the um, most common fear in a lot of these lists. You know, it's above spiders, it's above confined spaces. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about depression and anxiety because I've just written a book about it, so, but hopefully I'm not going to start the evening depressing you all and getting you reaching for your Prozac. Hopefully that won't happen. But yeah, um, glossophobia is, is the sort of um, closest and most people get to um, feeling in a state of anxiety is, is such a big, strange fear. And the very first time I um, experienced serious anxiety was when I was doing a, um, it, this was like in the 90s, 1996, I did a talk about art history at my university. I went to university in the north in Hull, and I chose um, an art history seminar. Part of our assessed work was to do a presentation on, on, on an art movement, a modern art movement. I chose Cubism. So I'm just, this is Picasso's Girl with a Mandolin, 1910. When I did this presentation in 1996, that slide appeared upside down. And so I was looking at it, and then I was sort of going back, and then I was starting to have a panic attack. And in my head, all I had in my head was um, Penelope Keith, the great, you know, the other great icon of 20th century culture. <laughs> and yeah, because I, I saw Penelope Keith on a, a chat show. It probably wasn't Parkinson, was it, if it was the 90s? But she was on some um, chat show, and she was saying that shyness is egoism out of its depth. And so I felt she was judging me because I was very shy and I was out of my depth, even at Hull University in front of 12 people talking about <laughs> cubism. Um, but yeah, nice painting. Um, th that is more like what depression and anxiety feels like, though. Cubism is... Um, where you start to sort of lose and abandon perspective. But proper depression anxiety, not glossophobia, um, not sort of stage fright, um, proper depression and anxiety is where you lose perspective altogether. So you see what I did there? It's abstract expressionism of the mind. Um, yeah, so anyway, that, that, that was just my sort of preamble. That was my cathartic sort of therapy session of um, getting that out of my system from 1996. Okay, um, is there any way out of the mind, Sylvia Plath? This is from a poem she wrote called Apprehensions. It's a very, very trippy, strange, dark piece of writing which she obviously wrote, um, she obviously wrote in a very, very, very sort of deep, dark state of mind. And when I became ill with depression and, um, later on, after I'd left university in 1999, and my head was a mess, I, I knew this. I didn't know the poem it was from, but we had a, uh, my family had a book of quotations. And this, all through the time I was depressed, and I was seriously depressed, I was sort of suicidal. Well, I was suicidal. And um, it took me a long time to get out of it, and I thought I would never get out of it. And all through that time, this question was sort of plagued and tormented me. Is there any way out of mind? Before I became properly, properly officially ill, I'd always thought the way out of the mind was just to go out and get drunk, take drugs, do things like that. Um, 
But those sorts of things weren't available to me. So I had to find other routes out of the mind. Like these things, Valium, Diazepam. Um, I was prescribed anti anxiety medication for depression, which is the wrong thing to do because it just totally makes the experience worse. I, I, I've just written a book about this, and I don't come out in that book anti um, taking pills, but it did not work for me. Um, but this is obviously the route um, a lot of people go down. Um, but the thing is with depression is confusing, and this is a metaphor for the confusion of depression. For those that don't know, this is Greenland, which is a real physical country, um, <laughs> an autonomous country, um, within the Kingdom of Denmark. But unlike Denmark itself, it has a very, very, very high suicide rate. It has the highest suicide rate in the world. Um, I'm trying to remember the facts, but I think one in five people in Greenland end up, at some point in their life, attempting suicide. Um, it, it, it's like, I think, the second place with the highest suicide rate is South Korea. But this is more than, you're more than twice as likely to kill yourself in Greenland than in South Korea or Lithuania, or anything else. And no one really knows why. People think, oh, weather. They think, you know, it's so far north. Um, they, there's yeah, a lot of guns, because they all go hunting. 90% of households in Greenland apparently have a gun. But there's no sort of clear, clear picture. But, so, that, so, so, I mean, that sort of represents to me the confusion generally about depression. Because I think even on an individual, personal level, when you become ill with depression, and one in five people anywhere in the world do become ill with depression, although the outcome isn't normally suicide, um, it's a very sort of confusing, mysterious experience. And when I did research for this book, Reasons to Stay Alive, um, I realised that the more, you know, that old Socrates thing, the more I sort of learnt about it, the more I realised we absolutely know nothing about this illness, and that's probably why there's so much sort of stigma and all these sort of stifling things still there with it. That is not Daniel Day-Lewis's best picture. <laughs> that is Abraham Lincoln. And he, he also, I mean, obviously, you can, it's very hard to say of historical people before people use the term depression that they suffered with depression because it was called melancholy in those days and it was a much broader term, you know, feeling a bit sad was melancholy. Um, but Abraham Lincoln probably did suffer from depression, if you look at his letters as a young man. When he was 31, <coughs> he wrote to a friend saying, um, I am now the most miserable man on the face of this earth. I will never amount to anything. 20 years before he became President of the United States. But that, that's, that's sort of how I sort of feel about depression, is that time becomes the best weapon against it, because time constantly proves that depression lies. And the things it tells you, the thoughts it gives you, are symptoms rather than facts of reality. Supermarkets are a nightmare. Um, I'm trying to... You see, the reason I came up with 15 slides was because um, I, I'm sort of bad at memorising speeches, so I thought, right, I'll have the slides to prompt me to say what I'm thinking. But no, I know what this slide is here for. Um, when, when I became ill, I had to live back home in Newark on Trent, which is depressing enough, if anyone knows Nottinghamshire. Um, and I, the, 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 I, I sort of became agoraphobic, uh, for a little while, and one of the reasons for that was I went to the corner shop and I just totally freaked out. And I, um, yeah, I don't know why, but it, you know, it's a common experience with um, people who suffer anxiety and depression that shops and particularly supermarkets are just a nightmare. 
um, for people who, so for, maybe it's because these sort of brands are like screaming for attention and you, you, you sort of like, you're hearing those sort of screams and it's, um, yeah, pretty heavy. So I, 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 I was basically in a kind of desperate state, still with that Sylvia Plath question in my head, is there any way out of the mind? Because, you know, I couldn't even go to Londis without having a sort of meltdown. But I lived with my mother, and she liked the theatre. And she thought one way out of depression, because depression's an invisible thing, so you get people um, wanting you to look, to be as normal as you look. So my mum, my mum she, she's a great mum, and she was a mum that I could um, be open with about my illness. But she very much wanted me to sort of go out and do stuff and do normal things, and that was the sort of cure. So, in 1999, Matthew Bourne's um, Swan Lake with Men, she took me there. She thought that seeing that would be sort of like therapeutic for me, but I was just like freaked out by these <laughs> men dressed as swans. I was like, is this a hallucination or something? And it didn't work, really. <laughs> Um, but actually, all these bad days, bad days, um, turned out to have a use. Because what, what depression told me when I nearly um, threw myself off a cliff in Spain when I was 24 um, was that everything was going to get worse. There was going to be no better point in time. But then, you know, as time goes on, depression is constantly disproven. And you build up a kind of bank in your head of all the bad days. And um, that, to me, was very sort of therapeutic. And um, so I, I would say, you know, at the theatre in Swan Lake, oh, this isn't actually as bad as I felt at the supermarket. So I'm making progress. I can go in a car, I can go to the theatre, I can sit there and not die. But the thing, um, eventually, when I was sort of back in my parents' bedroom, I, I, I was so ill, I um, even, you know, and, and this is, a, a, again, a very common experience. Depression is a horrible, horrible thing, but it's a very everyday thing in some ways. Um, as I say, one in five people officially suffer from depression, so it's probably more. Um, and... One thing that I found very hard was reading, like just sort of sitting and reading. When you're really, really depressed, um, words on a page mean nothing. You can understand the meaning, but you, you, you don't care. You don't care. Everything seems totally trivial to what you're feeling. It's like your legs on, fi on fire, but no one can see the flames. So it's very hard. But when I started to get a little bit better, I was very lucky, you see, because as well as having supportive parents, I also had a girlfriend, um, a long-term girlfriend, who's now my wife, who, uh, Andrea, who was very, very uh, well, patient and understanding. And, I mean, she didn't know any more than I did about depression, but she was very, um, you know, willing to go wherever I needed to go. And she, she told me to write things down, and she also told me to read things. So as I was back in my parents' bedroom, these are the actual books that I own. This isn't the shelf, because my parents have moved house. But these were the books when I was very ill, I looked at. And so they're obviously like children's books, um, like from Winnie the Pooh, C.S. Lewis, Swallowdale, Arthur Ransom, and stuff like that. And um, so I, I, these were all books that I, very, very, I knew very well. I couldn't have read anything he heavy. I'd just done an MA in English literature, um, where, you know, I was, did a dissertation on the Orientalism in Byron's The Corsair or something. I couldn't read anything like that, but to read stuff that I'd read and known as a child um, was just about possible. Um, for those that don't know, which is probably most of you, this is the um, first sentence of a book called The Outsiders. And, um, yeah, this, this was the, the sentence that actually I read and actually it meant something to me because I'd seen the film 
um, The Outsiders. I'd read the book lots and lots of times. When I stepped out into the bright sunlight from the darkness of the movie house, I had only two things on my mind. Paul Newman and a ride home. And it's not the best sentence in literature, but it, um, to me it became like a metaphor for depression. It became powerful enough to take away the sort of Sylvia Plath um, cloud that was dominating my head. And the idea of going out from darkness into light was very important to me. That is not me. <laughs> That's not even Haruki Murakami. And originally the picture was Haruki Murakami. That is Dustin Hoffman in Marathon. Um, so I, that's just me saying, you know, not to say that, you know, words are the way out. I also had to get physically healthy. Um, I'd been very unhealthy, so I was running and stuff like that, and that was helping me. But yeah, time was the big thing, because time constantly disproved everything I had felt. And, you know, the biggest cliche in the world about time healing turns out to be the truest one. Okay, uh, I'm going to break the rules on the very last slide, because you're not allowed to really read things out. But I thought my glossophobia would be mounting at this point. So I will just end with something I am going to read. It's very short. Um, it's about how, um, although depression has changed me in, in ways that are worse in some ways, made me sort of more sensitive to things, I've actually come to, come to believe that it's actually a gift as well as a curse. Sure, without a thin skin, I'd never have known those terrible days of nothingness, those days of either panic or intense, bone-scorching lethargy, the days of self-hate or drowning under invisible waves. But would I go along to a magical mind spa and ask for a skin-thickening treatment? Probably not. You need to feel life's terror to feel its wonder. And I feel it today, actually, right now, on what could seem like a grey, overcast afternoon. I feel the sheer, unfathomable marvel that is this strange life we have here on Earth. The seven billion of us clustered in our towns and cities on this planet. The pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it, spending our allotted 30,000 days as best we can in glorious insignificance. I like to feel the force of that miracle. I like to burrow deep into this life and explore it through the magic of words and the magic of human beings and the magic of peanut butter sandwiches. And I'm glad to feel every tumultuous second of it. I'm glad for the fact that when I walk into the vast room with all the Tintorettos in it in the National Gallery, my skin literally tingles, my heart palpitates. And I'm glad for the synesthesia that means when I read Emily Dickinson or Mark Twain, my mind feels actual warmth from those old American words. Feeling, that's what it is about. People place so much value on thought, but feelings is essential. I want to read books that make me laugh and cry in fear and hope and punch the air in triumph. I want a book to hug me or grab me by the scruff of my neck. I don't even mind if it punches in the gut because we're here to feel. I want life, I want to read it, write it, feel it and live it. I want for as much of this, the time as possible in this blink of an eye existence we have to feel all that can be felt. I hate depression, I'm scared of it, terrified in fact. But at the same time, it's made me who I am. And if, for me, it's the price of feeling life, it's a price always worth paying. I'm satisfied just to be. And that was about 20 minutes, so I'm sorry. 